Good afternoon and welcome to panel two, session A of the 2015 Simmons College Graduate Student Symposium. My name is Catherine Dixon and I am here to introduce our speakers. Um, today we'll hear from Kristen Weichel and Justin Quine. Kristen is a dual degree student pursuing her master's degrees in library and information sciences archives track and in history. She has studied French colonialism and anti-colonial movements and is particularly interested in the role that archives assume with regard to accountability of government solutions. Along the same, she is interested in the movements to digitize archival documents and increase accessibility of archives to the general public. Her talk is entitled, From Algiers to Kabul, Torture, Gender, and Empire. Justin graduated Magna Cum Laude from the College of Worcester <laughs> with a bachelor's degree in anthropology and a bachelor's degree in classical studies. He is currently working towards a master's degree in gender and cultural studies here at Simmons. His research interests lie in the intersections of gender, sexuality, and alternative religions, as well as gender, sexuality, language, and technology. Upon graduation, Justin will pursue a career in both queer student life and queer nonprofit work. His talk is titled Androgynous Studies, Deities, excuse me, the Queering of Masculinity and Femininity through Neo Pagan Myth, Ritual, and Symbol. Everybody's ready for that. Good That's not it. So hello everyone, I'm Kristen, as Catherine so kindly introduced me. Um, and today I'm going to be talking to you about uh, the use of the intersection of torture, colonialism, and gender structures in the use of torture in, um, in the Algerian War and the War on Terror. Um, so first I'm going to give a little bit of background about each of these wars. So the Algerian War uh, was from 1954 to 1962, and it was during the time of the decline of empires. Uh, the British Empire had just um, given had just given uh, India its independence in 1947, and the French had just lost in Indochina, in uh, Dien Bien Phu. So they had just left Vietnam. The U.S. later came in. So this was just a time of just general collapse of empire, and the French uh, colonial empire um, is distinct in this in that it practiced uh, a policy of assimilation which means it was French policy at this time for their colonial subject, subjects to assimilate to French culture, meaning practice French cultural customs, speak French, educate in the French ma manner, ideally become um, practice Catholicism. Like These were all like policies of the French Empire at this time. So the war on terror, I'm assuming more of you are familiar with. And so from 2001, shortly after the 9-11 attacks, to 2008, <laughs> with uh, the death of Osama bin Laden. <laughs> and a lot of the war on terror policies have derived from Cold War policies, specifically policies regarding the Soviet-Afghan War, where the United States was uh, went into Afghanistan to um, attempt to stop them from falling into communism. And in order to... Um, and as part of this effort, they trained the Mujahideen, who, and in this, while training the Mujahideen, they created these networks of Muslim fighters throughout the world, which were later used against them by extremist uh, agencies such as Al-Qaeda. Um, so, during these conflicts, the respective states utilized both physical and symbolic torture to reinforce and defy gender and colonial boundaries. Um, gender, like, I'm sure Justin will talk more about different gender theories, but um, for the purpose of this one, um, in a lot of gender theories state that in times of war and conflict, <coughs> gender becomes hyper genderized. So in this, I'm talking a lot about masculinity, so it becomes hyper-masculinized. And as Angela Woolacott says in Gender and Empire, militaristic definitions of masculinity became dominant in a complex interplay of imperial expansionism and jingoism. And this is referring to the fall of the British Empire, but it applies to 
different collapses of empires. So um, hegemonic masculinity is really important for these discussions of gender because um, hegemonic uh, masculinity refers to the unequal power balance um, between genders or between between even like same genders but different classes so race plays a huge part into hegemonic masculinity I'm not going to get into that in this presentation just like an FYI um, so the use of torture itself is an example of hegemonic masculinity for it is a way in which people assert their identity their dominance over at the expense of another's which is the idea of hegemonic masculinity um, sexual exceptionalism is one of the other gender theories I came across um, which was prevalent to this work um, and it is exactly what it sounds like um, the and this is tied to nationalism the idea that one cultures or one identities sexual exploits are better or more than another's and this came to play in the case of Algeria with the threats and in some cases though I can't I can't like specifically state which because I don't have time <laughs> um, the threat of a castration which is both physical and symbolic ways to assert one's own masculinity and at the same time take away another's um, which again is the idea of like hegemonic masculinity and in the case of Guantanamo it's been stated in several different reports that one of the most common verbal assaults against detainees is the fact that they will either learn how to or be fucked like an American so this idea that <laughs> right <laughs> this idea that American sexuality is as this implies better than another culture sexuality is right into this idea of um, sexual exceptionalism and it it again playing into these colonial ideas of asserting one's own dominance at the expense of another's um, another common thing that was done in both of these cases was the feminization of men um, in this case, this reverses the um, the patriarchal structures pre currently present at the time currently present in society. Um, so, for example, in Abu Ghraib, one of the things that was, um, which was an Iraqi prison, um, one of the things that was done to prisoners was that they were forced to wear women's clothing, specifically women's undergarments. While this is a not very forceful form of um, I wouldn't necessarily say that well this is a different form of torture than we're usually that's usually portrayed it's nevertheless very effective because it um, effectively attacks their cultural identity and their gendered identity while at the same time forcing them into the colonial constructs of identity so for example by forcing these men to wear women's clothes the person who is the torturer the person who is forcing these wearing upon them is both asserting their own masculinity and taking away their own gendered and cultural identity. Um, in the case of Algeria, this was um, a similar structure was completed with the attack of women's virtue in Algeria. So it was common practice in Algeria for when militants were away from their home to go to their homes, arrest their wives, bring their wives to prison, rape their wives, and send them back to their husbands. So this is using the woman herself, her virtue, as a way to feminize this patriarchal structure of the fact that the man is supposed to be responsible for this woman's virtue, and therefore attacking the man's masculinity through the virtue of his wife. Um, in another flip side of this is the masculinization of women. In the case of uh, Guantanamo, women's bodies and a little bit with what I just described. Women's bodies are used as weapons. In, in Guantanamo, in, according to the schmidt furlow report, women were used as a form of torture. Women were, uh, were told to sexually tempt Muslim men by undressing themselves and touching Muslim men inappropriately, essentially using their own bodies, specifically their sexuality, to attempt to torture these men. On similarly related, 
one of these cases in the sh um, listed in the Schmidt furlough report was the woman says it wasn't actually this, but um, one man was threatened with menstrual blood. Like a woman said that she would like spread her menstrual blood on him. So she's using an aspect of her femininity to torture these men, um, and in a sense take away their masculinity in this form of torture. She, according to the report, she says it was red ink, but she, to me that doesn't matter because she said the man believed it to be menstrual blood. Um, an important part in Algeria is the veil, which Franz Fanon describes in his work as Algeria unveiled, that according to European colonizers, like this, this is done how he believes European colonizers thought about the veil. Every veil that fell, every body that became liberated from the traditional embrace of the hike, every face that offered itself to the bold and impatient glance of the occupier was a negative expression of the fact that Algeria was beginning to deny herself and was accepting the rape of the colonizer. So the idea that the, the veil is both physically and symbolically what's separating Algerian women from their colonizers. So in Algeria, one of the, during the Algerian war, one of the other forms of torture that was done was deveiling of women. So in a very physical sense, it's removing the woman's clothing, a part of their clothing. And symbolically, it is removing a part of their religious identity by taking away that veil. And at the same time, it reinforces the colonizer's view of femininity. Because in France at that time, most women were unveiled. And so while both taking away her own identity or her own cultural and religious identity is reinforcing that of the colonizers. Um, so for further research, I will be, I'm still working on this paper. I'm trying to get some more firsthand accounts about from Guantanamo and Abu Ghraib, which is kind of hard because <laughs> they're all been redacted from the government. <laughs> um, and I also want to tie this into archival evidence because in the case of Al Algeria, it took 30 years for the archives to become open for researchers. And in the case of Guantanamo, who knows <laughs> how long that's going to take. <laughs> Um, and I want to leave with uh, this quote um, by Said Qutb, who was an Egyptian national who wrote this as he was awaiting um, a, full, a Fulbright scholar, Egyptian national, awaiting, prison, um, awaiting execution in an Egyptian prison. Um, and these criminals sat by the pit of fire, watching how these believers suffered and writhed in pain. They sat there to enjoy the sight of how fire consumes living beings and how the bodies of these noble souls were reduced to cinders and ashes. And when some young man or woman, some child or old man from among these righteous believers, was thrown into the fire, their diabolical pleasure would reach a new height, and shouts of mad joy would escape their lips, and the sight of blood and pieces of flesh. This was written by the, this Egyptian national I just described in 1964, which was right after Algeria. This was before Abu Ghraib, before Guantanamo. This was like before the Arab Spring, just to give like a sense of still a how like that hatred that simmered um and that's my presentation here's my primary sources of the war on terror in case you guys were curious <laughs> and um on the algerian war I don't have a fancy PowerPoint. I'm sorry. Um, so my name is Justin Kalini, as I mentioned. Thank you very much. Um, and my paper is entitled Androgynous Deities, the Queering of Masculine Affinity Through Neopagan Myth, Ritual, and Sybil. Again, buzzwords. Um, I want to start off with a little bit of a disclaimer that this is a theoretical paper. Um, so there's a lot of jargon in it. Um, so if you all are confused, please feel free to be like, I don't know what that means. And I'll happily explain it to you. Or just give me a bunch of confused looks, and I'll, I will uh, express my terminology. <coughs> so, my paper is centered on the religious tradition of neopaganism and its potential for the creation and validation of alternative, i.e., non mainstream forms of masculinity and femininity. I'm going to really have a hard time saying femininity a thousand times. Uh, my research questions are 
In what ways do contemporary pagan ritual practices, symbology, and mythology redefine masculinity and femininity for the celebrants? Moreover, how does this challenge normalize gender roles? Throughout, I'll be using theories of John Dewey, Victor Turner, and Barbara Meyerhoff to prove my thesis that contemporary pagan rituals, symbols, and myths redefine the concepts of masculinity and femininity by offering semi-historical alternatives and instances of time out of time, or liminality. Does everybody know liminality? Cool. Um, as a means of constructing an identity centered on a personalized creation of faith, participation in a resistant subaltern community, and unashamed ecstatic union with deity. This identity challenges traditional gender roles by finding, fusing traditionally masculine and feminine traits and are using them in alternative, non-stereotypical ways. So this is a more positive version of the masculinization of women and the feminization of men, theoretically. <laughs> um, <coughs> so the issue, gender, rigid gender rigidity as violence. The traditional gender economy only accepts without rebuke highly specific iterations of masculinity and femininity. These iterations become boxes, caricatures, which no one, no one truly fits into, but are forced to try for the sake of social interaction. Furthermore, this binary empowers a patriarchal state in which men are politically, socially, and economically placed above women, hegemonic masculinity, um, and those who don't identify as either are considered anathema, culturally unintelligible monsters. Here's my required Butler reference, unintelligible monsters. Got to throw Butler in there. Uh, New paganism, with its study of pre-Christian faiths and practices and its focus on ecstatic ritual, free expression, and altered states of consciousness, places its celebrants in a variety of roles which do not necessarily fit the norm of gender. My research question is thus important to both scholars and lay individuals who do not fit the macho stud or cheerleader stereotypes, because it can be used to validate alternative forms of masculine femininity while offering a safe haven for those who wish to express them. These alternatives, though through their very existence and performance, and through a some change in gendered habits, challenge the rigidity of the gender binary. These challenges over time create a more gender fluid, gender variant social world, with the potential, if not the specific aim, of disrupting hegemonic patriarchal institutions. Is everybody where I'm coming from? Any major questions? Okay. Um, so I'm going to get a couple of definitions real quick for new paganism. So what is new paganism? Um, New Paganism attempts to recapture, Sir Ron Hutton, Ronald Hutton states, the numinous, the magical, the sacred in nature, and the human form. Numerous historians, anthropologists, folklorists, and practitioners have attempted to narrow or add his general definition. Loretta Orion, an anthropologist, puts Neo Paganism within the model of a nativistic cult, a revitalization movement that places value upon that which is native and free from external influence. Uh, Margot Adler, author of the groundbreaking Drawing on the Moon, she's a goddess, I love her, claims it to be a Euro-American movement to rediscover the myriad roots of various lines of folklore. Ron Hutton goes on to define New Paganism as a revived religion, one of many that have occurred throughout history. As a revivalist religion, New Paganism is a religious movement, or movements, that draws from numerous religions to form an adaptable hybrid that's something entirely new. New Pagans, even as using such terms as pagan and witch, create oppositional culture. Sabina Macchioco, an anthropologist and folklorist, states, New pagans reclaim terminology previously devalued by the dominant culture, and they create an identity in opposition to certain aspects of mainstream culture. New paganism's status as a subaltern culture, a culture of resistance, is key to understanding the ways this tradition resists the oppressively rigid gender norms of mainstream society. Furthermore, it is through a shared sense of marginality that LGBTQ individuals, many of whom do not conform to stereotypical gender norms, or sexual norms for that matter, are able to find solidarity within pagan communities. So going to my theories, um, symbolic anthropology creates an understanding of the importance of myths, rituals, and symbols, and offers a means of identifying and analyzing them within a specific cultural framework. Victor Turner attempts to take, a specific ritual, to take specific rituals and create a structure, a lens, through which various cultures may be analyzed. Symbols can be further divided into dominant and instrumental symbols. Dominant symbols appear often in culture's overall ritual canon, popping up in a variety of different contexts. Um, so for example, the, for America, the eagle, um, the, the flag. Uh, the 50 stars, etc. That would be a dominant symbol. Um, instrumental symbols must be viewed in relation to the ritual during which it is being utilized and how that ritual reflects the larger cultural system. So say, for example, the, um, the national anthem um, during a, the game of a ball game, something like that. Uh, the symbols of the goddess and god within various New Pagan traditions can be interpreted as dominant symbols, while androgynous and gender non-conforming versions of deity, or non-gender essentialist versions of the goddess and god, can be seen as instrumental symbols. Meyerhoff combines the theories of Levi Strauss, Gears, and Turner in order to visualize symbols as concrete and tangible conceptions which usually conform as objects. Such objects maintain a range of reference and multivocality uh, and are enacted in behavioral contexts or social dramas. Myths explain, contextualize, and rationalize symbols without providing concrete definitions. 
Symbols without some form of ambiguity fail in their purpose of distracting participants from the unsatisfactory nature of present arrangements, social and ideological. The symbols are used to enter that state of time out of time where you can fully express yourself without being worried about the day-to-day -day stress and drama going around you. Does that make sense? Um, I'm sorry there's a lot of theory. I apologize. <clears throat> Ritual is the stylized, formalized, and repetitive activity that provides a medium for symbols to be used without full comprehension of their meanings. Rituals protect participants with their predictability and structure, allowing liminal situations, such as interactions with the divine, to keep the sense of danger while ensuring the safety of the participants involved. The queer myths, rituals, and symbols collected by Regina Obler, Martin LePage, and Randy Connor can be strained through Meyerhoff's theoretical filter in order to form a range of reference within some pagan traditions. To explain and contextualize his reference, and to understand ritual as a medium for the usage of symbols and their localities. And the purpose of my paper is to use those symbols and myths and rituals <coughs> in ways that express non binary, um, non gender conforming identities. So, Neopaganism and Dewey. Clara Fisher, drawing upon John Dewey's habitual itself, describes in Conscious and Conscious the aha moment of coming into feminist consciousness. That is a person's recognition of the internal doubt or friction caused by their past or current habits and the need to change them, in this case towards a more feminist alignment. Regina Obler, in her article Negotiating Gender Essentialism in Contemporary Paganism, describes a very similar occurrence, whether as an epiphany or as a process, with individuals entering into a, quote, pagan consciousness, unquote. Uh, women identified uh, pagans describe their reasons for converting to paganism, often for Christianity, as tension with the rigid rules of gender and worship, in addition to obvious patriarchal influences of most mainstream religions. Such friction surrounding patriarchy may be one reason James Lewis's and Inga Tollefsen's gender and paganism in census and survey data has shown women to outnumber men in nearly every pagan denomination. And there are dozens of denominations, for the record. It's very confusing. Uh, seminal pagan texts such as Adler's Drawing on the Moon or Sarhawk's Spiral Dance are often given as catalysts for research in paganism, as well as in-depth conversations with friends and peers who are pagan already. The introduction of a new body of knowledge, supplemented by a specific community capable of providing an approval or disapproval mechanism, falls neatly into Fisher's usage, Fisher's usage of Dewey's original theory. The fact that paganism has been highly influenced by feminism for the last three decades also provides support for this analogy. The changing of one habits to a pagan worldview requires recognition of gender equality, as masculine and feminine energies are considered to be the two primal forces of the universe. So you have the masculine, you have the feminine, combine to create the universe. Um, so gender essentialism, which means that there is the masculine and the feminine, um, versus union anima animus. Does everybody know about Jung? Carl Jung? Anima animus? Cool. Um, this idealistic worldview creates a version of masculinity that has historically been almost subservient to femininity within pagan circles. The Lord, and thus his masculine identified followers, is seen as a protector and consort rather than a leader or ruler. Traditional or Gardnerian Wicca, which is the most common, um, is very specific in the power and roles of its members, and major rituals are conducted with equal numbers of heterosexually aligned couples in order to properly merge masculine and feminine energies. So you generally have um, six pairings. So you have um, six uh, male identified individuals, six female identified individuals, um, and together their energies create magic, quote-unquote, or willpower, if you will. This gender essentialism is empowering to women as the high priestess is the unquestioned leader of the coven or circle without emasculating any of the men within the group, but is not particularly supportive of non-normative gender and or sexual alignments. Furthermore, while the roles may be alternative to the mainstream, the gender binary is quite intact in this setting. Obler's article in another Dewey-in du 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 Shift of Habits monitors the movement away from gender essential in many pagan traditions towards a more gender variant, gender fluid understanding of masculine and feminine energies. She discusses at length the recent sociologi sociological discovery that the aptitudes and behaviors attributed to male and female identities, the foundation of a gender essentialist definition of masculine and femininity, are overlapping normal curves between the sexes. Wide varieties with no significant differences exist, and interviews and social experiments reveal no major support for gender essentialism. Um, this study came out in. 1988, basically showing that the ideas that men are better at, um, let's see, for example, men are more logical, um, men are better at hard labor, men are better at management positions, that kind of thing, doesn't actually make sense. Um, that there are, there's a wide variation, um, and you cannot just say that women fit into these gender roles, men fit into these gender roles. Um, so the understanding of this study is important because it influences feminist culture. What year did you say that was? 1988. Yes. I mean, there's, there's been a number of different studies that have followed up on that as well. Um, so, th I mean, there are some things like men do technically do math better, quote unquote. But when it comes to the application of that in the everyday life, um, we tend to exaggerate that in order to fit gender binary. Um, there we go. 
Ober's interviews and survey did also point to the Jungian concepts of anima and animus contributing to the shift. More and more pagans are identifying the Lord Lady priest priestess duos as symbolic, with differing types and levels of masculine animus and feminine anima energy present within each individual. So you can have a shifting amount of femininity and a shifting amount of masculinity in one body. Um, Obler believes the reason for this shift lies in the increase in popularity of feminist gender. Hello, friends. People I know. Can be less nervous now. Um, in the increase in popularity of feminist gender and queer studies within the educated U.S. Uh, Maggie Oko, Orion, and Lewis and Telefson's data all support Obler's assertion that pagans are overall middle class, educated, and white, with the power and privilege to read understand such studies. <coughs> Mary Neitz, in Queering the Dragon Fest, also notes a shift away from gender essentialism, as well as heteronormativity, uh, but argues the cause to be a shared marginalization with LGBTQ individuals, many of whom do not fit into the norms of the traditional gender binary. Uh, LePage is a Lokian family queer, pig, queer and pagan agency in Montreal describes one example of a shift away from gender essentialism. Now we're getting into the fun stuff. Less theory. Um, through the group dynamic and ritual tendencies of the Loka Brenna Kindred, the primary deity of this Montreal-based group made up of nine queer and trans-identified individuals is Loki, a gender-bending, shape-shifting tripster god of the Norse pantheon. To give you an example of that, um, if, you know, if you don't know any Norse myth, Loki transformed into a horse in order to become the mother and give birth to his father Odin's horse, Slepnir. Yeah. <laughs> so Slepnir is an eight-legged horse ridden by Odin, who is Loki's technical father, and Loki transformed into the mother of that horse. I don't exactly know why. <laughs> um, each member of the kindred may define gender a different way, but the freedom to make such divergent, non-binary definitions grants them power or magic within their own selves and within their pagan community. Similar freedom of expression is given prominence with the Nietzsche's Queering the Dragon Fest, with the men who wore skirts and the women who wore horns, serving as progress towards a society which allows, quote, fluid and shifting performances, end quote, of sexuality and gender expression, without locking oneself in to a taken-for-granted sexual or gender identity. Um, Megaloka and Orion describe ritual as a binding experience for pagans across the world, one which connects them culturally while expressing their beliefs and desires through the working of magic. Victor Turner's theories of symbolic anthropology allow for the widely disparate forms rituals take within different pagan traditions as there are certain anchors of ritual practice or dominant symbols within each. So, for example, my undergraduate senior thesis work was on Dionysus, and I studied him in three different time periods for his dominant symbols, which are the, um, the theorists, the wand, wine, dance, frenzy, chaos, etc. Um, one such anchor is the bounding of ritual space, usually within a circle, in preparation to enter a liminal space, a time out of time. Um, so before a rage ritual, you'll make a circle um, to bound, it's actually a spear, um, to bound the energy within, so it doesn't go wild. Um, as a place of transformation, ritual offers a safe and relatively structured space within which one can express alternative forms of masculinity and femininity. For the theories of Meyerhoff, the myths and, rich, myths and symbols used within particular rituals distract the individual from overanalyzing ritual mechanics or their participation in the ritual, while contextualizing the meanings the ritual is attempting to, to convey. The repetition of acts within the bounded space in combination with the specific roles and participant, participants take, um, in addition to a certain suspension of disbelief, allows each participant to become an intrinsic part of the ritual, their acts becoming symbolic in and of themselves. This allows you to think um, that, yes, that sword is a penis, that, yes, that bull is meant to be the vagina, that when you enter one to the other, this is a symbolic reference of sex, where you don't, you're not overanalyzing the rituals as it's happening, you're able to see it as a symbolic interpretation. Um, that's why um, chanting, singing, dancing, drumming also kind of puts you into that ultra state of consciousness so that you can have that suspension of disbelief. <coughs> that's where the magic happens. Uh, earlier, I described the older gender essentialist mo mode of thought within Gardnerian Wicca and its descendants. Sloan's thesis work describes at length how this essentialism is represented, represented in the ritual symbolic instruments of the Wiccan altar. Rituals such as the Great Rite <coughs> reenact the mythic union of the go goddess and god, thus reinforcing such gender essentialism. That said, my studies have found a number of rituals focusing on alternative conceptions of gender. Ober describes a number of queer great rites in which the lore is embodied by a female-identified priestess and the lady by a male-identified priest. Uh, great rites is what I meant by the, um, the dagger, the athame, and entering the, the bowl, um, symbolic of sex. Or in some cults, not to say cults, some covens, excuse me, um, there are actually sex rites where the great rite is done physically between different groups. Um... The local Brennan kindred, described by LePage, lead a third gender ritual at the Kaleidoscope Gathering in Montreal, Canada. Here, masks are used to symbolize the feminine, the masculine, and the androgynous. Each is connected to a specific Norse deity and their defining myths. The masks are passed between ritual participants, each of whom enact and discuss their interpretation of the gender rules represented by the masks they hold. In this way, variant forms of masculinity, femininity, and androgyny are explored, critiqued, and subverted. 
My undergraduate, undergraduate independent study thesis involved research into a Dionysian Komos ritual that is held annually at the Between the Worlds Festival, a festival specifically uh, for self-identified gay, bi, queer, cis, or trans men. Um, cisgender means that your gender identity and your um, biological sex align. Um, this ritual involves a celebrant entering ecstatic union with Dionysus, also known as channeling, anointing the ritual participants with a sacred punch and leading them in a chant and invocation of Dionysus as the Lord of Plants, the Lord of Animals, and the Lord of Revels. This invocation is followed by several hours of drinking and dancing, during which many forms of dress, dance, and behavior are expressed. Dionysus himself is an androgynous deity who gender bends and shape shifts in a number of different myths. This ritual was chosen by my primary correspondent because as a priest of, Dion priest of Dionysus, he had helped to construct the ritual and a person experienced what Magioko calls the, quote, juice of ritual, end quote, uh, which is ecstatic union with his deity. So if by ecstatic union, I mean that you actually physically either become or contact your deity, and it is a, a form of uh, mental and physical ecstasy, um, which is dangerous outside of bounded spaces and rituals. Uh, Magioko claims ecstasy to be a commonplace within pagan ritual practices. The structure of the ritual, the ambiguity of each symbol, and the binding of the circle at the beginning of any ritual allows this channeling to, channeling to occur safely while putting the celebrant in the appropriate frame of mind. The repetition of chan chanting, dancing, or drumming creates an altered state of consciousness in which the participant can enter a trance state and may act out as their deity. This experience is relevant to my study in particular because it creates situations in which ritual participants imply deities of the opposite gender, deities who express their gender in alternative ways, who may encompass multiple genders, or are androgynous. So you could be somebody who identifies as a woman, but you are um, acting out as Ares, God of War, who is one of the most macho stud types you can find. Uh, such experience is extremely powerful and can leave lasting marks on a celebrant's conscious upon leaving ritual space. My last section is on the festival. Um, the festival as a ritualized hyper-reality. Um, festivals offer a place of discourse and celebration between individuals who identify across the neo-pagan spectrum. Situated in a ritually bounded space, geographically isolated from the wider world, Sarah Pike describes festivals as an escape from, quote, mundania, end quote. It's a fun word. You should put it into your everyday usage. In her article, Forging Magical Selves, Pike discusses the ways in which pagans construct themselves with and in opposition to the festival community. She's careful to note that while pagans present themselves as an alternative to the mainstream, gender roles and codes of contact, conduct based on public safety and morality also have their place in the festival space. That said, the majority of her article frames the festival in terms of Turner's liminality and liminoid. Uh, liminoid means um, change which is sustained over a period of time, so during festival time, three or four days, versus liminality, which is generally one specific instance, one specific ritual. Uh, drumming and dancing serve as performative languages. Cross-dressing and costuming allow one to express a part of themselves lacking within Mandania. And the fluidity of individual identity in festival culture allows experimentation with multiple selves, selves born from the traumas and troubles of the real world. Real world. Uh, festi festival is a, quote, hyper-reality, end quote, an ideal way of being in one's own skin in relation to others. The space is temporary, and the change in gender gendered and sexual expression may seem illusionary, but I believe, it leaves I believe it leaves space for personal transformation. I conceptualize ritual acts and festival attendance, uh, festival attendance itself being a form of ritual, with structured acts of magic occurring within the bounded space. Uh, in a similar manner to how Shan Sullivan, conceptualize Shan Sullivan conceptualizes the works of Dewey and Butler in Reconfiguring Gender, Ritual and festival free their participants to follow their Dewey, Deweyan impulses to express Butler's, quote, bodily excess, end quote, without fear of societal reproach. As liminal spaces, however, the way one transacts to the world during ritual and festival is often too different from Mandania to maintain cohesion upon reentry. Yet, I believe bits and pieces of the habits of ritual and festival may insert themselves into the real world, again, quote, through a changing of one's, quote, standard, end quote, habits. The man who wears a sarong, or the woman who wears horns to the dragon fest, May, may not be do so in their normal life, but they may be willing to dance more freely at parties, to engage in conversation of opposite gender clothing or activities, to wear bits of makeup or not to obligate to shave every part of their body, to get a new haircut, or to pick up a new way of moving or a different posture, etc. So things that you do in festival space you might not do at your day job, but there are bits and pieces that you might pick up and add to your regular, your regular life, your everyday life outside of the festival space. Such transformations of a habit can occur to any and all participants, but it's important to note that this process is particularly important to LGBTQ pagans. Uh, a ritual need not be a third gender or queer ritual in order to be life-changing. The symbols and myths used in the rituals are multivocal, with many interpretations of meaning. Festivals offer a wide range of rituals, workshops, and activities for the celebrants, and each has a different theme and population. The essence of, quote, repetition, juxtaposition, excess, end quote. Combined with the emphasis on creative energies and communal ties, allow for the expression and validation of non-normative sexual and gender identities. 
Simultaneously, pagans who may identify as cisgender heterosexuals are willing, at the very least in these environments, to express their sexuality and gender in non-normative ways. So just, you don't have to be queer in order for this to have an effect on you. Does that make sense? Cool. Um, last section, conclusion, I promise I'm almost done. It's very long, sorry. Um, the myths and rituals provided by Obler, LePage, Connor, and my undergraduate work Focus to the theoretical lenses of Turner and Meyerhoff provide a semi-historical, semi-contemporary body of knowledge for the pagan wishing to express masculinity, femininity, and or androgyny in ways alternative to the mainstream. This body of knowledge is supplemented by a pagan community which Obler, LePage, Sloan, and Neitz have shown favors gender equality and is open to new interpretations of gender over time. In comparison to the patriarchy of the Abrahamic religions, um, so Judaism, Christianity, Islam, um, even the gender essentialist version of paganism, where there is that gender binary, um, which will allow a woman to, quote, strap on a sword and play the man, end quote, if the role is needed, can be considered alternative to, to standard gender norms. New pagan ritual practice, whether done as a solitary, with a circle or coven, or within festival space, are filled with multiple symbols and instances of ecstatic union with deity. Depending on the interpretation of the celebrant and the deity being invoked, alternative forms of masculinity and femininity can be embodied without fear or shame. Festivals are partially liminoid in the sustainment ritual space over several days, offering a psychedelic experience outside mundania. The combination of a mythic body of knowledge, a pagan community, of ecstatic union, ritual, excuse me, ecstatic ritual, and a liminoid festival allow the changing of one's habituated self. Changes in habit may be small at first, but over time can offer a freer and more fluid expression of gender within both pagan spaces and mundania. The political influences of neo-paganism and its status as a subaltern culture, in combination with a widespread changing of gender habits among its, constitu- among its constituents, offer the potential for widespread cultural and institutional change, while continuing to provide opportunities for personal transformation, validation, and growth. The theory being that it's going to be a ripple effect. If you have, <clears throat> say, uh, 2,000 people at a festival, and 200 of them have a life, uh, some sort of life-changing experience, and they go out into the, into the real world, quote-unquote, and change their habits in some small way, and that happens every year, that over time there's going to be a f- uh, freer society when it comes to gender uh, through that ripple effect. And that's my extremely theoretical paper. Time for questions, so how about it? Shouldn't be a term. Um, I have a, a question for Kristen. Is it about how you chose those particular historical places to convert situations yeah. to compare, as opposed to like war in general? <laughs> Um, well, I studied French colonialism, um, and so I wanted to do a um, like a traditional colonial empire. And then um, with, I started thinking about this project when the um, Senate report came out. And there's lots of evidence suggesting that um, policies that took place in Algeria were what policies the United States uses today are based off of. And so that connection as well is... So to, to me, it was like, oh, these two are totally related. I have another question for you. Um, you talked about the women that were used in Guantanamo Bay to kind of taunt the prisoners. Do you know anything more about who these women were, where they came from, how they often participated in this? There are CIA operatives, okay. and their names have been redacted from yeah. the papers, so I, I can't be like, it's James Smith. Yeah. <laughs> um, but they, um, the, the documentation suggests that they are CIA agents mm-hmm. who were given these orders. Um, beyond that, I do not have much information. Um, they do go in um, certain documents. They go out of their way to try to... Um, make it seem like the CIA does not hire women, but then if you look at different documents, it's very clear that they do. Um, so I'm not sure if that helps you or not. Yeah, yeah. It's, um, it's a very weird dynamic. So my sophomore year of college in Worcester, I'm in the grand course, my favorite class of panel of priests. Do you have a class of priests? She's my favorite class of priests. It was called Magic Witchcraft Religion. 
Um, so now I don't. I was a classes, uh, classical studies major, classical studies major, and college major. So I've always been interested in um, classical literature and classical mythology, like the Roman and Greek mythology. And so just what combined those with Neopaganism, because Neopaganism is a way for that to be continued and revived today. Um, so coming here, that got mixed up with a whole bunch of gender and cultural theory. Um, so you can see like Richard Turner and Meyerhoff are my anthology bit, and then John Dewey is my gender and cultural studies bit. Um, I just wanted to combine those two interests. And it was a lot of fun. I really enjoyed writing the paper. Um, I wish that I could turn, I, I would love to turn into like an ethnography. Um, well, she's like, I'm going to visit like the local Brenda Kindred, or I could do some more work with the Dionysian folks that I talked to in Ohio. Um, but resources, not a lot of that. So. Do you know of any similar um, ethnographies on the subject? Uh, Sabina so Mapioko, who was one of my primary sources for this work and for um, my undergrad, which was 160 pages. So. <sighs> <laughs> um, <laughs> this one. Um, so you might writes a book called Wishing Culture. Um, it's just a book of school. I can't even tell at the moment. Um, but she looks at a number of different um, American groups in California. Um, and she has an ethnography of those groups and then kind of branches out of the abstract you know, and the as a whole. Um, she's a beautiful writer. It's, it's magnificent. Wishing Culture reads a little bit of dissertations, a little thick at times. Um, but she does great work. And she is both an anthropologist and a folklorist. Um, so you have a combination of those fields. Mm -hmm. um, Loretta Orion is an older writer, also an anthropologist. Um, she wrote Never Again the Burning Times. Um, that is less than ethnography and more of a general scope of the evangelism, um, but it involves ethnographic bits as well. Hmm. And actually, I'm sorry, one more. Uh, Mary Neitz, she wrote Pouring the Dragon Fest. Um, it's a shorter article, easier to read, but it's all about the Dragon Fest. So this, this is the best mm -hmm. Question for Justin. Have you attended any of these pagan cultural events and then talked with people thereafter about maybe change of habit or um, their performativity in their mundane lives? Mm, I didn't have that, 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 that uh, terminology with me when I did so. Um, but yes. Um, so for my undergraduate, undergraduate work, I went to three different festivals. Um, the Earth Warriors Festival in Southwest Ohio, the Witches Ball in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, and the Yuletide Gathering in Florida. I don't know where in Florida, somewhere in Florida. Um, and so I, I did several interviews, I had six interviews, uh, phone interviews. I did a lot of French observation work, um, and I talked to different individuals at the festival as well um, about particularly that point time ritual and simple. Uh, but also, also uh, about gender as well as a whole. Well, change the world one habit at a time. Question? Yeah, that's awesome. Do you have any differences in use of language? Like, language people use depending on which words that they were thinking, or like, um, yeah, I guess I don't know enough about the technology, but there's this other. No, no, I didn't have a guy come. Um, so, being aware of pronouns was huge. Um, so you don't really go into most places outside of academia that ask you for your gender pronouns, um, which can, is probably partially because, as I mentioned with the census data, the majority of pagans are middle class, white, and educated. Um, but when somebody was channeling a different deity, or somebody was, say, the local brand of King Jake, for example, holding a mask, and they were doing uh, a feminine role, and they might be male-identified, um, their pronoun, pronouns would be changed. Um, also, just that a freedom to talk about um, to talk about gender when it comes to clothing, when it comes to say jewelry, when it comes to um, body hair and hygiene. It's the ability and the freedom to talk about that. There's a lot of social tensions, a lot of social taboos in mundania, quote unquote, uh, about discussing that because gender roles are pretty well defined. Um, depending on what you're at, of course. Does that answer your question? Yes. Yeah. I have a question that I kind of hope both of you will think about and mm -hmm. answer. Um, and since both, are like everybody's, you know, kind of talking around the concept of gender, um, do you think that an expansion or kind of a breakdown of the barrier of binary gender dynamics would improve um, both of your particular areas of study in any way? Um, it's, I think it's hard for me to say because uh, my studies have passed, 
So, <laughs> um, I it also I, could be like the projection of like uh, that particular, you know, like in using gender for purposes of torture. That has had like these particular circumstances in the past, but um, it continues or it could have the potential to continue. So, do you think that would be uh, that would have effects? On uh, the effect on the torturers or the torture or both? Okay. Um, I think that that would be very, very interesting. Um, I think that a lot of the stuff that I was looking at, um, it's kind of hard to break out of those because at the times, like for example in Algeria in the 1950s and 19, early 1960s, the binary idea of gender is very much present and it's present in their actions. So I think that would be very interesting to examine, but I don't know how like how much fruition would come from it. Uh, that's exactly what I said. In the book. <laughs> um, the idea is that if if we open up gender to a lot of different forms of masculinity, there may be an androgyny um, or anything in between, however you want to find that in between or outside of that. Um, that while a world that doesn't necessarily have to form boxes, um, that doesn't have to form boundaries of what is okay and what is not okay behavior-wise based around gender. That said, I'm sure we'll find something else to put those boundaries in, because we love putting people in the boxes in one form or another, be it whether they have a stutter or whether, you know, um, race and ethnicity, skin color, etc. We'll find something. But I would love to see a more gender, uh, gender-free, gender-fluid, gender-conforming world um, or even those who identify as a man, identify as a woman, uh, allow masculine and the opposite to kind of flow in as well. So that would be of young and animus and young and anima in one person. Go back. I have a question about the term of masculinity and femininity because I understand why we use them, but they also trouble me because I think that. And maybe the animus anima thing is sort of a workaround for that, but that whenever you have these things in this list are feminine and these things in this list are masculine, and maybe in the ideal world we all have little bits of things from each list, I feel like as long as we still have those two lists, the problem is perpetuating itself. And I don't know how to, I don't know what the answer to that is because we have to obviously use the language that we use and that we know. And I also know that people's gender expressions and identities are deeply important personal parts of themselves, right? And yeah, so I get that. I'm, I'm going to stop talking myself, but I, I just I want to know your thoughts on that. <laughs> no, I think you were entirely correct. Um, we are bounded. I mean, reality is not the that we have to define it. Um, I already said that, but it's really important somewhere. Um, <laughs> and we don't have that new language to use, and even if we come up with it, if you're in academia, or if, whether it's a grassroots activist group, or it's the local burning kindred, um, that can work within their space and their realities, but to put that into the mainstream, mainstream, quote unquote, to put that into the big world, um, it would require a massive shift in infrastructure, in industry, um, in just how we think about the world itself. That would have to happen in part of our generations. Um, I think it's the goal, I think it's the excellent. But we all start just the mind itself wants to categorize. Um, and Levi Strauss, Claude Levi Strauss, would tell you that we don't want to fix things binaries. We like to think male, man, woman, uh, male, female, heterosexual, homosexual, etc. Even though there is all that gray area in between, um, because it's complicated. And so we can think about that here in the privileged space of academia. But when it comes to the rat race every day, it's like I have to look at my kids. I need to make my bank statement. I have to go to my job. I have to do blah, blah, blah. I don't have time to think about that because I'm just going to work with what I was taught. Does that make sense? I mean, it does, yes. I don't like I, it. Right. I don't like it. Trust no, me. I, I feel like... It's not arguing. You know, that here event is where we need to be really doing that. And yeah. I don't know. I mean, I don't, I, I don't have an answer either. It's just like that. It's a caution that I think about a lot when I'm thinking about gender studies. The idea would be that we would, we would, we would create it here and then we would put it into the education system and start teaching from a very early age. Um, but I think that attempts to have done in the past, attempts to, if, it, if there are attempts to have in the past, I'm not sure if there have been, those are probably going to hit up against the wall when it comes to the political investment that is required. Um, but in your personal life, um, in, in small groups, by all means, if you, um, if you want to remove gender, if the individuals who uh, identify any gender or by gender, who just don't want to talk about masculine identity, gender, period, they just want to be. Um, that's what we're personalizing at this point time.
Any further questions? Well, questions with you. Um, are there other examples that you've come across historically besides the Algerian war and then currently kind of the war on terror where they use gendered forms of torture in these situations? Can you think of any other? Um, I, sh I think that a lot of torture is very gendered. Um, why I chose these two is because they're very sexually exploited forms, which um, just kind of highlights the gendered forms of torture. I am sure there are more, but for the setting, I kind of I found that connection between Algeria and the war terror that I explained earlier, and so I kind of stopped my search at that point. Um, onward, it's just too depressing. Um, but I'm sure that like it exists in some fashion. I can say that in ancient Greece and ancient Rome, there are various forms of sexual torture as well. Um, it might not have specifically as much detail, this is a bit as far, but when it came to insults and it came to uh, different forms of clothing, um, and also rape, uh, specifically uh, slave populations. Um, yeah. Well, also, like, just the English language, most of our um, swear words are very sexualized, mm -hmm. specifically uh, like attacking women's sexuality, mm -hmm. and that's just like everyday speech. So. Can I throw an interesting note on real quick? Um, just, it's, it, I, think, I think it's really cool when it comes to the Greeks. Um, Greek citizens, if they are annually penetrated, would lose their citizenship. Um, they were actually inspected at the age of 18. So the idea of pederasty, where there's an, an adult tutor and uh, a younger boy who was being taught, they were taught on eating slaves. Um, the older, the gener older gentleman never penetrated the boy. The boy would penetrate slaves as a uh, form of being taught. Um, and even today, in um, modern Greece, um, PR for tourism has tried to shy away from the whole pederasty, um, you know, homosexual, uh, homo homosexuality kind of identity. Um, and while men, um, men can, even if they're married, can pretty freely have sex with other men as long as they keep them down low, quote unquote, they have to be the penetrator if, if they can't penetrate it. There's much more angst around gender identity and mas being masculine. Because being um, penetrated is a form of feminization. That's a broad answer to your question. Yeah, that's totally <laughs> <laughs> well, we can break and uh, come back to 15 for the next presentation. Plenty of time to set up. <laughs> <laughs>